Welcome to BAA Talk First Session. Uh, ich bin Stefan Pichner. Uh, mein Name ist Nigel Benjamin Bauer. Ich bin der Founder und der Managing Director of our Aviation Advisory and Consulting Firm, exclusively working for the aviation industry. It is my great pleasure and my honor to have Stefan Pichner today uh, at our BAA Talk Session. Stefan uh, is very well known in aviation world. He used to be the CEO of uh, Airbnb Chassera Hermes and most recently Romeo Shogging. It's a pleasure to have you here and thank you thank for you. taking your time to come. So I would like to start now with the first common question. How did your career start in aviation and why did you choose aviation? Well, uh, before uh Starting into aviation, I was a professional runner. So I was an athlete traveling around the world for international competition. So I loved traveling. And then, uh, well, after that I studied and uh, then I had to choose a job and I wanted to have a job where you can come around, you travel around, you're not stuck in a country. So then I, I had the option to start with Lufthansa, which I did. So that's why I was hooked on travel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, I think uh, people can learn from somebody like you who used to run marathon because they had the mm. pressure of hands to go through so long and the quietest and keep running. Um, so as the airline CEO, uh, the former airline CEO, what did you enjoy the most when you had time for yourself? Well, uh, I, I never separated my time between time for yourself and time for the company because what you try to do in life is you try to do the things which make you happy. And that's what I also try to do in business. I try to do things in the right way. I always try to add some value in whichever things I did, whatever company I had to run. And this made me happy. So, um, so I always had a very holistic approach to life, which includes private life, family life, business life, everything. Because you only have one life, so you have to be happy every minute and make it happen every minute. And that's, I think, key. It, uh, I don't think it, it, it's very wise to spend his life in misery or chasing things you can't get. Of course, you set yourself big targets. You dream big to achieve maybe not the dream, but a little bit less, but even more than you ever expected. And that's great. And I learned that a lot with Richard Branson at Virgin. But, but uh, uh, yeah, every moment uh, in business life, uh, basically looking back, contributed to happiness and self-content. So when we are looking at your CV and your personal background and the career background, you have uh, run several airlines in several parts of the world, in Europe, in the Middle East, Asia, Pacific. So I would like to ask you, which market has surprised you the most? Two uh, aspects to look at. One is the airlines. So, so one, some of the airlines uh, were low-cost airlines, like Jazeera, like Virgin in Australia. Some of these airlines were legacy airlines, like let's say Fiji Airways or Royal Jordanian or others. Uh, so there were different business models and you have to cater for business, different business models in terms of culture because different business model to, to, to execute different business models in a successful way means that you need to develop different cultures within the company. So that's one thing. On the other hand, uh, if you lead a company, in reality, uh, you don't manage numbers, but you lead people. And, and now, uh, which is common to all the peoples, uh, all the human beings you manage within airlines, which is service industries, you have a lot of people uh, in these companies, is basically uh, the same needs. It's regardless if somebody uh, works and lives in Jordan or in Fiji or in Australia or in Germany on France or whatever, in reality, all the people who go to work or, yeah, almost all of them, they want to add value in what they do. They want to be respected. They want to have social contacts. They want to be loved and they want to be respected. Uh, so if you, your job is to make people walking in the same direction to be successful together at the company, you have to give them this. And uh, one important 
lessons I think is in whatever culture you work, you can't fake it. You have to be, you have to, as you say, walk the talk. And people will, in whatever culture, they have, all people have a very, very good sense and sensibility if you fake it or if you're real. And there's nothing to do with language, nothing to do with different uh, cultural skills and whatever, and history and background. You have mentioned the culture a few times. When we are talking about culture, you know the aviation industry is a very special industry because in many airlines you have employees from many different cultures from mm -hmm. across the globe. Specifically exactly. in the Middle East where you have employees from yeah. over 100 nations. So when we are talking about culture, do you see there need to be a lot of sense done in the aviation industry when it comes to the culture because now COVID-19 has so, and I need to put the focus more on human investors in order to come out from the crisis and emerge stronger from the crisis when they put their focus on employees and the organizational culture. How well, do you see this as CEO? Well, well, yeah, well, well, look, it has always been the case. Uh, the companies who had the strongest people culture uh, have always been the most successful ones. Look at Southwest Airlines, look at Virgin. The, the companies would really put people, which means customer, staff, in focus, in the middle of their, their, their efforts, have always been more successful than companies who just manage numbers. People make numbers happen. Numbers don't drive people. So at this is especially important in the airline industry, which is a service industry. Yeah, uh, that is the very interesting point when it comes to the science and all the things. So when we are now putting more COVID-19 now to the main topic, uh, we are talking about aviation during the pandemic. Uh, we have seen COVID-19 has uh, arrived and we have been dealing with COVID-19 for the past 10 months, basically. And it has impacted the aviation industry in the Middle East as well. So how you will characterize the impact of COVID-19 on the aviation industry mm. in the Middle East, maybe specifically in short, from your experience? Well, um, I, I think we all are on the same boat and, and as we see now, and everybody has done his little recovery scenarios. Uh, initially, all of our airlines, not only in the Middle East, we went and, and did our little recovery scenarios and said, okay, maybe 2023 are back on the level of capacity and consumer minimum uh, as we were in 2019. Then down the track in May, uh, we re everybody revised its forecast and say, okay, maybe we'll be back in 2024. Uh, so there will be a, hopefully a recovery, but it might take longer as we think. And you see things like, I'm not talking about, it means like Lufthansa now, they just announced that they have to cut further capacity in winter because of the lockdown in Europe and whatever, whatever. So uh, they try to, to get less aircraft and less staff employed and um, to go and to preserve a position where they don't burn too much cash. And now I transfer this to here, this is exactly the same. I mean, you have, you have uh, very different players here. You have the big network airlines like Emirates, uh, Etihad, Qatar Airways, uh, who basically are focused more on the connecting traffic and you have the more point-to-point -point airlines like Royal Jordanian and others and Arabia and so on, Jazeera, who focus uh, on uh, transporting people from A to B. Now the question is, um, well, everything is hit now, but how would recovery look like? And I, I think that what you will see also, uh, in favor of the big players here in the Middle East is that uh, visiting friends and relatives will recover first, followed by tourism. Business travel will take the longest time to recover. And if you make this assumption, then we also have to make assumption uh, in what areas, in what traffic streams, in what parts of the world will this recovery happen first? And I think the first recovery will be more regional, um, national or regional, and the long haul will be in the end. So uh, if you put all this together, then I think that network airlines, 
like the three I just mentioned, Emirates, Etihad, and, and the Qatar Airways, uh, probably should be in a better position to recover faster than some of the big competitors outside of the Middle East, uh, which is good news, which is good news uh, because uh, the airlines here are uh, much more seen as a cornerstone uh, for GDP development, for economic growth, etc., for the country, for the region, than it has been in other countries. And then you have small airlines who have been, uh, suffered the same consequences, which means loss of revenue of 95, 96, 97% for a couple of months. And they will probably uh, need much more and much longer government support to survive. What you will see overall in the airline sector is, as you always see in this crisis, and I've seen a couple of crises in my long professional life, uh, is consolidation. You have the bigger guys will get bigger, will get better out of it, and the smaller guys will struggle or disappear. And that will also happen in this part of the world. Yeah, um, when we are talking about um, the full service network carriers, like uh, in the Middle East or in Europe, like Lufthansa, um, you know the hub and smoke model, like the operating model among the hub and smoke has been compromised by COVID-19 as well because of the enormous complexity of things, because every country is following other regulations and requirements. So do you think... Uh, and you know, COVID-19 has also put allies and partnership to in another level to make airlines survive better the crisis and overcome the crisis together with new partners. Because the landscape is changing, the cars may be mixed again. So if you see uh, allies and partnership will play a more important role after COVID-19, or you see more airlines will do more on their own in terms of network, connectivity, and, uh, well, I, I, what, what will happen in the airline industry most probably and unfortunately is that we will see overcapacity in the next couple of years because uh, airlines will try to grow the market. So they put more capacity in there. The markets will not recover as fast because uh, stimulation will not work as it used to work because people people need to travel because they need to go from A to B, not because there's a 10 bucks cheaper bargain out there. So consumer behavior will slightly change. So I, th I think I think initially you will have uh, the airlines trying on their own to stimulate market, to manage capacity, to manage cash point, etc. Because in the end, uh, we are all not in a game of making money. We are in a game to, to who lasts the longest to avoid burning so much cash. This is a key motivation. So alliances and co-chairs and whatever are drivers to grow the markets together. So I think in the initial phase of recovery, they will not be as important. Okay. But I think that once uh, we've overcome this uh, uh, pandemic, a pandemic which will probably happen the next one, two years, uh, and traffic starts growing again, of course you will have alliances, partnership in a more important room, but there will be different kinds of alliances and partnerships. Uh, there might be more equity partnerships. It is uh, initially, I remember in the 1990s when I started with Lufthansa and we did the, uh, the Star Alliance, yeah, which was basically only marketing. It was a couple of interline agreements, code share, branding, whatever, whatever it was to grow the market. And then the whole alliance world, also the Sky team in one world, they tried to get into this purchasing on whatever. We didn't really work. And now it is, if you look at the alliance partnership environment now, there are partnerships with all alliances, the partnership within alliances, whatever. So the alliance per se, it's a nice branding exercise. It has some benefits, but that's not the ultimate answer. So when you mention Australia to Dubai to Europe, uh, now I would like to ask you, uh, what is your view on the development of ultra long coal flights bypassing the hub uh, on the way from Australia to Europe, uh, which is supported by the development of efficient aircraft like the Boeing 787 and even the shagging customer behavior, premium customer, 
uh, Faber Diverse Place. So how is your view on the machine development? It's driven by technology. If technology enables you to, uh, like uh, has been said before, to travel from Europe to US in one, two hours, of course that's exciting. Yeah, There will be a premium to be paid for that. And a lot of people uh, might not, want to pay the premium because they visit their friends or they're there for tourism purposes and they don't care to stop somewhere or whatever or have a stopover somewhere. Uh, but of course it will change behavior. It will change behavior. A supersonic um, will, will change behavior and uh, it might not it might not be the solution for the next three, four years, but the development cycles will take a little bit longer of the, like that anyway. So if you talk about 10 years time, yes. So we may have a couple of network like a cognitive side. So now I would like to ask you, a lot of airports are now implementing the strategy to do the COVID-19 fast testing yeah. in order to bring people back to fly, specifically business travelers or travelers with the motivation to visit friends and relatives. Mm. That is the specific market which may be about quicker exactly. than business and nation specifically in the Middle East. But do you think implementing COVID-19 testing at airport is the only one solution to bring people back to fly? Or do you see from your point of view, they need to be additional measures implemented? But in reality, uh, what we, we need to develop, and I, I think uh, IATA is somehow uh, should lead on that, uh, is, uh, and not only IATA, but other institutions as well, is that we, we, we collect all this data and we, because uh, this bio data basically, and we use them and we have a global database of this bio data and we know exactly that you tra want to travel from Dubai to Rome and we know when you have been last tested and we know where you are and whatever, whatever. And this provides in reality, much more comfort. Yeah, because what you also try to do uh, when you travel, you try to protect yourself from others. So this gives more comfort, yeah? Man, it's good for marketing purposes. You say, okay, fly to Dubai, you need a test at least for uh, 96 hours before you fly here, then go to the airport, one testing, boom, gone. Beautiful, we are open for tourism, yeah? That's great. Uh, and it's a first mover advantage. It's fantastic marketing. It helps getting confidence. But if you took at the big picture globally for the industry, yeah, then I, th I think uh, creating this global database, uh, data collection points, sharing the data and having common strategies and common policies in place, that's a big thing. I mean, what, what happens now is basically le lessons to be learned from that. This is a challenge and different countries, different airlines, different airports have tried to respond in a different way with different results. If you look at the, uh, the, 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 the Kiwis, uh, the, these guys from New Zealand now, which, uh, who have really shut down and blocked off the, uh, the uh, country for months and months and months and basically had not much of, of, of COVID going on. Now the Australians have done that for a while, especially in Victoria, and now are basically managing it. The Chinese have done it in a very well way. Uh, others haven't and suffer the consequences. So uh, I, I, I think the future lies in uh, global strategies and policies for that to get uh, the customer of confidence back for travel and have the markets grow. Will the markets grow? Yes. To make it come to the bringing the confidence back. Uh, of course, the collaboration on several levels with several stakeholders is also very essential to bring people back. So you think airlines should put the competition on the side and come up together uh, with the solution to communicate to the government about the importance of the aviation to the economy of the country? Because I'm talking more about the perspective of Europe we are dealing mm. with several actions by governments in specific countries in Europe and in the UK. So you think airlines should come together all in one, Europe might, and put pressure on the government and the other stakeholders to implement standard approach? 
Well, I, I think that's, uh, that, that's driven by the, the governing board of airlines, which is the IATA. They should come up with solutions. They could, should come up with recommendations uh, for, 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 for the world, not only to a specific country, but for the world. And, uh, well, of course, if a couple of key airlines come and say, we do that and that and that, that's beautiful, but it would be preferable for the industry as a whole that we have a global approach. I, I, I think in the meanwhile, if we look around the globe, to my understanding, there's no more a discussion if an airline is needed somehow for GDP growth, for, for trade and for I mean, everybody knows that, yeah. Uh, because some countries went to the pain uh, to let their national carriers go bankrupt or out of business, and then they suffered the consequences. So either, and if you look at the at the financial aid, uh, especially the big guys, but all the smaller guys get now from the governments, you see there's a high level of awareness. Uh, what airlines do and mean for the world and for the economy and for the people. Uh, but... but uh, for fighting the COVID, I think uh, it needs a global, uh, a global commitment and a global strategy and and global proposals from the airline industry, which is beyond one, two, three, four airlines. So maybe I'm going back to the perspective of the airline. A uh, few airlines have been preparing for the challenging winter period. When you mentioned about Lufthansa downscale the operation and uh, basically keep up the winter business because nobody will be able to travel because of a lockdown. They have no confidence to stay up while doing the lockdown somewhere. So a lot of airlines are now start preparing about uh, for the summer schedule because the summer schedule could provide new opportunities for airlines to make a part up from the past few months what they have lost in terms of revenue and uh, cash flow. So if you were still the CEO of the airline today, what would be your main priority? How to handle the airline through the winter period? Flexibility. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, what we need, what, what we all look like, look uh, is cash burn. So what we tried to do, with my last airline I managed, is we tried to avoid to fly any flight who would burn cash, which means revenues are less than the running cost of the flight. We would avoid that. We cancel this flight short term. We don't do that. And I think that's a strategy for everybody now. So we are not talking about profit p &L, We're talking about cash. Because less cash you burn, the longer you can survive. Now, the other thing is, Capacity. And capacity is driven by the aircraft you own and the aircraft you lease and whatever. So if you have a lot of leased aircraft, then most of the lease, or all of the lease contracts globally basically uh, protect uh, the leasing companies more than they protect the airlines, which means if you want to get out of the leasing contract, you have to pay your, the NPV of the contract full stop or you go bankrupt. So it's a, it, it's a little bit of a one-sided game. Yeah. So, so of course, what you try to do is have flexibility, uh, negotiate with those guys, park own aircraft and whatever, whatever to flexibilize your capacity. Because what we do not know is how next summer, how next spring will look like. We know nothing about vaccine. We know nothing about the areas of okay. We know nothing about the development. It's just now throwing little darts and hoping. Yeah, of course, what will happen is that probably most of the airlines will have ambitious plans for recovery. And what will happen then is most probably that all these ambitious plans will not be realized. Yeah, and then you scale back capacity. So it is, it, it will be, the airline industry probably in the next two, three years will be a uh, trial and error. You put capacity, oh, too much, go back. You put capacity in, too much. So it will be not a recovery like that. It will be like that in waves. Yeah, Waves is trial and error. Waves also mean losing money. So, but that's most probably what it will be. Yeah, the flexibility you might now during the crisis and during the pandemic, uh, that is the crisis uh, we never experienced in our uh, life before. We had the financial crisis, we had uh, several outbreaks in specific region, but COVID-19 is the completing new crisis of Asian experience now. 
Men vi har talt i Hoppe Flexibility. Uh, few airlines, uh, even large airlines in the United States, they are keep adjusting the schedule of each single month based on the development. Exactly. But when we are looking from the customer side, customer experience side, you don't think uh, that you will harm the customer confidence when they are facing a lot of cancellations of flights and the most big issue as well when it comes to the fun of tickets. Mm. Customer have been waiting for months and this has harmed oh, yeah. uh, the customer experience and the malicious between airline and the customer as well. So how will you as CEO, for example, steer a this to find the trade off between customer experience, cancellation of flights, adjustment of the network and mm. the schedule in order not to burn cash? Everything is related. So the, the, the decisions by airlines to add capacity or to cancel short-term flights is related to the customer behavior and demand. Uh, customers are the same people who are living the COVID crisis now in their environment, have been locked down, restaurants closed, bars closed, whatever. It's extraordinary times. So in extraordinary times, uh, people are ready to take more pain or which means a higher level un of uncertainty as everything runs smoothly steady state so basically we are all in this together and of course it will happen to customers that they can't get on the flight because it's short term cancelled because there are not enough bookings or whatever whatever and other flights happen and maybe there is now a new destination next month which hasn't been there before because Demand looks quite promising, whatever. So as I said, also for the customer, it's a trial and error. We are all in this together. And now what we don't know is to what degree and how fast uh, solutions for this COVID issue are available uh, on a regional, national level, on a regional level, on a global level. I'm pretty confident that uh, what's been happening here in the UAE is very promising. Uh, my, the guys here, uh, and I'm talking, the government are doing, a, I have to say, a great job uh, in pushing solutions. Uh, also, on the medical side, if you so look at the vaccine, the tests and whatever, uh, it's fantastic. Mind, these guys will hopefully, and I think rightfully, come out ahead of the curve. Ahead of the curve. What's been done here is, is exceptional. Is exceptional. It's exceptional. It's much better what has been happening in Europe and whatever. Yeah. So when we are coming back to the customer, we have seen over the past few years support by the innovation, support by the digitalization with my space to big data. The frequent flyer program of airlines has mm. become a very valuable and important asset for airline companies mm. as well. How do you see uh, the importance of Fragment Flyer program now during the pandemic and after the pandemic in order to increase the liquidity of airlines and to preserve cash? Well, I, I, you're right. Uh, I remember, the, I remember that there was many years ago at Virgin in Australia, we created a Fragment Flyer program. And within two years, it was worth more than the airline. And the, uh, other airlines have the same phenomenon. It's quite interesting because the multiples uh, these companies have related are, are, are substantially more than the asset-heavy airline industry. And this customer data are valid in a different way. Uh, I, I, I don't think the frequent flyer program will play a key role at the way they are currently structured in a recovery a scenario of the airlines. I think what will be more interesting is uh, that we somehow use, merge this customer data we have in our frequent flyer programs with all the customer data you gather in social media with Google and Facebook and whatever, and then be able to tailor offers much more to the individual. So the fly, frequent flyer programs um, of the next generation will be uh, much more targeted marketing tools, not standard rebate programs. Initially, it was standard rebate programs, yeah, uh, but it will be very targeted marketing tools because 
they should be able to know much more about every single member of a frequent flyer program than they ever know before. And if you combine this data in a smart way, you can predict their purchasing behavior, you can predict their price elasticity, and you make you can predict their, where they want to go to in holidays or friends or business or whatever. So they may be much, much more targeted. So beyond that crisis, I think uh, the first airlines who managed to combine this data, were able to combine this data, and draw the right conclusions will be big winners. Yeah, I fully, I, I'm fully on your side. Uh, the personalization of offerings and targeting or putting a customer at the center of everything to understand all the needs is one of the most crucial things airline need to comply with in the upcoming months and years to go. Um, and we are looking now at the future of the aviation industry. Um, in order to boost or speed up the recovery of aviation and to him, what are the most three important points the entire aviation industry need to do now in order to speed up the recovery? To get a global agreement on COVID testing procedures and quarantine rules, that's, 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 a, that's the key driver which explains 80 to 90% of everything. Yeah. And this needs then to be supported by uh, revised standing operating procedures uh, while operating flight at the airport, etc., to give confidence back to the consumers that the necessary steps are done and there's 100% compliance. So this and this and then in the end, marketing. Mine. When we are talking about the uh, I, I'm not talking, sorry, if I just... Uh, I'm not talking about... Well, the. the Issue with my the trap in which some airlines might fall then is that they say marketing is pricing, let's do promotions, whatever. And I have so many seats now, let's promote them. I think this would be the wrong way because in the current environment, and this will probably not change in the near future, the price elasticity of the customers will be significantly lower as in the mature market we had before in 19 and 4. So, so, uh, so the key drivers in terms of messaging and positioning of your airline brand is confidence, consumer confidence. Yeah, it's safe to travel. There are rules. There is the same for maybe airline. I don't run it. It's the same for all airports. And the airline, I choose 100% compliance. And that's the key drivers. Yeah, it's my sense. Uh, when we are talking now about the future of the business models of airlines, we have several business models. We have low cost, we have high pre and full service. And you know, after every single crisis we have been facing in the past 20 years, it has forced airlines to reshape and rethink their entire business model entirely or partly uh, in order to emerge stronger out from the competition. So maybe I'm looking now uh, at all several airlines. How do you see uh, Mukul become the big winner of the crisis? Uh, because we have been discussing uh, in the industry, uh, when we are talking about the hybrid mm -hmm. carriers, the hybrid carriers have an advantage of strong balance sheet, very strong national presence in many parts of the world. So how do you see what mm -hmm. kind of business model could emerge stronger from COVID-19? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because uh, we we talk about boxes. Yeah, people to make their life simple always put airline in boxes. This is a legacy airline. This is a hybrid. That's a new thing. That's ultra low, uh, no low cost, long haul, and that's low cost and whatever. Yeah, that has nothing to. Do, that doesn't drive P and L or anything. This is just for making a journalist's life more easy because they put things in boxes. In reality. Um, the newest market entrant is always the biggest challenge to everybody else because the newest market entrant has the lowest cost, full stop. And if there's a beautiful low cost airline and then somebody else starts a business with low cost initially because goes go up, he or she is in a better position. Boom. Yeah. Okay. So having, having the lowest cost per se, of course, an advantage for every, every, every airline. If you fly a network or whatever you do, if you have the lowest cost, it's very simple. In an asset, 
in a in a in an industry which has not earned the cost of capital in the last 25 years, which is marginal in terms of profitability, which is asset heavy, which means has high risks. Yeah, the the the, the company with the lowest cost always has an advantage. Full stop. Full stop. Yeah, and the next thing is the market. Okay, now you can have a very sound domestic market which feeds into your uh, into the rest of the world. Then you are a bigger airline, you operate bigger aircraft, and more aircraft doesn't necessarily see that it means that you're more profitable. You just add to the complexity to the system and you can uh, tell people, oh, we have 10 million passengers or 50 million passengers a year. Uh, it has nothing to do with company value. Yeah. Uh, or you have a small little airline, whatever so-called is also, also a box, a boutique airline, who just serves a couple of key O and Ds from the home market, and they make money with it because the mix of this team of the demand is very balanced between business, leisure, and and uh, busy friends and relatives and tourism. So they balance it out quite effectively and make good money. Uh, that's that's what it is. So there is no clear winner. Of course, in this kind of business, having lowest cost is a good one. Having a strong brand is a good one. Yeah, uh, having a Having a supportive government policy is also an important one. Good regulations, uh, the government supporting the airline because they believe in the added value of the airline has for GDP growth and job security and job development, employment. Sorry, uh, this is a this is a big one. And everything uh, the, these are the key drivers for recovery. That's the key drivers for recovery. When you mentioned about uh, low cost, long call, most few airlines have been trying, including uh, your home wings, uh, under the Lufthansa Group. Um, no, nobody that, has ever like, made money. So no, let's, let's be frank. Low cost, long haul, nobody has ever made money. Because if you look into that, just look into the P&L. Look where you can save money. And look how, uh, how sustainable your unit cost advantage is if you operate long cost, long haul. It's, it's fake. It's fake because you burn the fair fuel, you have the cost advantage is not there, is not there, is not there. So it is a marketing gimmick for attracting investors money or whatever, but it is not show me any so-called long haul, low cost airline who has ever made money. None, none, none. For my point of view, uh, I see Norwegian, uh, Eurowings, uh, Asia long haul, whatever, nothing. From my point of view, we have seen uh, several airlines have been trying to enter the market with this kind of low cost, non cost yeah. products. And uh, that is the other side. From my point of view, I see the airlines just do this in order to the bank market share with the yeah. low cost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah, of course it's the bank market share. Notice. Of course, the, the, only, the only idea is we make that noise to, to scare others off. Uh, or, or whatever, uh, inv attract investors because of market share. I'm talking about p &L. I'm not talking about the usual airline game, market dominance, global dominance, whatever. But I'm talking about just running a p &L. And in the end, be profitable. So it's not good for profits. Airline is only business. It's a p &L and a balance sheet. Exactly. So uh, when we are now coming to the end of our BAA toll station, I would like to ask you one final question. When you are looking back at your career in aviation, mm -hmm. what are these things you would have done better when you are looking back? Oh, I can do things better every day. You know, and a lot of things you, in hindsight, or you obviously have the benefit of the hindsight. If you knew that before, yeah, uh, I would have done differently. Mine, life is the road ahead. And on the road ahead, you travel, you try to do the best you ever can every moment. Well, my point was always I tried to, to give it all, all I had and all I knew at that moment. And uh, hopefully, most of the times it worked. Sometimes it didn't work. Uh, that's it. I mean, I can only say, well, but that's also part of devel development. If you're a young guy and I've been running big companies from the mid thirties on, uh, then you're a little bit, uh, more number focused than people focused. 
So for me, for me, a big change was, you know, and as you can now sign a high that you could have done better, was when I met Richard Branson and, and, and the people focus of his airlines. And I tried that and it worked so much better and it was so much more fulfilling for myself. So making this move, which is probably a move, not only me, but a lot of people make as you grow older, you move a little bit, you balance a little bit more from the number perspective to the number people and number perspective. Uh, so then in hindsight, you would have done things some well differently because you didn't account for the people argument as much as you would for the people as much as you would do now, would do now. That's the only thing, but uh, look, in reality, it has been an exciting journey. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, I, I think I lived and worked in 10 countries around the world uh, and it's beautiful. Now I love to be here in Dubai. Yeah, that is my thing. Uh, maybe I'm uh, talking about a few so meters of aviation. Uh, I think we can come to the agreement. All these people need to put their focus on people yes. in order to make aviation a yes. better world for everybody. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. of course. I mean, you always try to balance everything out. Uh, but uh, people uh, in an environment, in a world which will, whatever political leaders are there today and tomorrow, whatever, the world will grow together further. And in a world which grows together further, the people skills will become even more important. Stefan, uh Thank you very much for Thank coming. You. It was a great pleasure to discuss with you these topics. It was very inspiring and very insightful from somebody like you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>